Okay. Yeah, history of animals from isotope records. Uh, um, so today I'm going to, uh, today is a sort of animal day, and so I'm going to take the first uh, chunk of time before our coffee break, and then Seth Newsom will, um, just, uh, will take on from there. And uh, in putting this together and thinking about it, um, I thought I'd just give you a bit of a, a background here. I know that most of you, your real goal in life is to get a paper in nature or science or proceedings in the National Academy of Science, right? That's kind of the pinnacle. Well, the real pinnacle is getting the cover, right? If you can get a cover on one of those things. And so here was a paper that I was, you know, an umpty ump author of. We got the cover of PNS. And this was a neat one because there was a book written about this topic. So we'd worked on the lions of Savo, which are the two man-eating lions that you can see stuffed now at the Field Museum in Chicago. And it was made into a movie. It was the first 3D movie ever done in about 1950. And so that, you know, not only did we get these man-eaters and so we got all this attention, but this really isn't the pinnacle. What we discovered shortly thereafter was that we inspired a New Yorker cartoon. Okay, so that really is as good as you can do, inspire a New Yorker cartoon. Uh, so, so that's, that's, if you can beat that, you got me beat. Okay, today I've split my talk into six pieces. And um, one of the things about being a geologist is that we are fascinated with time. And so I want to talk about biological systems and how we can explore time and maybe get a little more information out of time uh, by looking at sequences of, of isotope measurements. Okay? And uh, we'll cover a variety of things. Um, I'm going to first talk about uh, when we're actually not doing time, we're doing steady state. So par C, par T represents the change in concentration of something could be an isotope ratio, over time is zero. So that's a special mathematical case, which is a steady state um, situation. Um, then I'll look at another situation where we can uh, look at rate constants. We'd like to know how fast something is taking place. Um, then I'll give an example. And in particular, the nice thing about first order reactions is that they're very convenient for forward models, which are really easy to deal with mathematically. And uh, I'll just give you an example of a project I worked on. Then we'll look at some other examples of forward models um, in which we can learn about other physiological things. And the examples I'll talk about are how long it takes blood cells to form and, and then also how fast they turn over. How you might correct for growth if you're looking in at something. Then a bit, something a bit more complicated, something that I call here inverse methods. This is a, 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 um, some mathematics really borrowed from the geophysical community, which we call signal processing. If you have a complicated signal, um, what is the most probable input that describes an output. Um, and then I'll just give some examples of, of inverse methods where we see if we can recover an original signal. So I gave this equation on day number one at the top, par C, change in concentration of something over time, has four inputs to it, a diffusion component, uh, uh, and that's represented by D, the diffusion coefficient, it's the second, um, uh, second order. Uh, an advective component, something is physically moving. A first order rate constant, that's the lambda, and then other chemical reactions that might affect your stuff. Now, in, there's a special case in which the change in the concentration over time 
is zero. And so if all of these factors go to zero, then you have a special case where the or steady state condition, the change in your isotope ratio, say, or concentration of something is zero over time, then you're in a steady state condition, okay? And it could be that, that it's because, uh, for instance, you may have a bunch of reactions going on, but they all cancel each other out. So the net reaction is actually zero, although there may be stuff going on. And so you don't want to think that it means that there's nothing happening if you're at steady state, there are lots of things happening, and Seth is going to describe some of those complex things in his, his lecture. But in certain situations, there's actually nothing is changing over time. Okay? So, uh, so that's, a, that's a mathematics of the steady state. And I'll just show a couple of experiments that we did here. About 15 or, or so years ago, Jim Elringer, uh, and I, Jim was a botanist, there was me, there was um, Denise Deering, who's now department chair, but she's an, a mammologist, and John Harris, who's a paleontologist. Um, we got together and managed to get a wonderful uh, grant from the Packard Foundation that let us do, let us have a lot of flexibility. And one of the things that we came up with was to uh, study, uh, do a, a bunch of large animal experiments. Okay, uh, up until this time, most um, experiments using stable isotopes were done on very small mammals, like um, mice, occasionally rats. I think the biggest one up to that point were rats. Uh, and then a few experiments had been done on some birds, okay? So we did some large animal experiments. We worked with llamas. That's kind of the team there. Ben Passy is in there. Um, Matt Spoonheimer and so on. We worked with rabbits and, and actually we began working not on captive animals. This is George Wittemeyer who was a student in this class some years ago uh, actually collecting uh, elephant tail hairs. <clears throat> okay, so um, what we'd like to do here, and I don't think I've, I do have a pointer here. Um, somewhere, push on the bottom. All right, what we'd like to do is we, we start with diet, we make hair, and that's what we actually measure, and then we need to go back. So this is an experiment we did uh, trying to quantify uh, how those pools change. Uh, this has great applications to ecology, and then we're going to talk somewhat about um, tooth formation. Okay. So the key elements in diets, which is what I'm talking about today, is C3, C3 versus C4 photosynthesis. So we're going to take the, really the simple case where we go from C3 plants to C4 plants. And uh, this is uh, just a diagram showing the general, a very generalized distribution uh, that, that was before we, we could do some of the fancy computer graphics. But the important thing to note is that uh, between about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, we have ecosystems dominated by C4 uh, photosynthesis. And uh, in terms of the grasses, we have up to 100% C4 grasses. As we go to higher latitudes, more and more um, C3, C3 grasses. So a convenient, um, well, a question would be, how long have we had this ecosystem that we have today where C4 plants are really, really important in the tropics. So a couple of students and I investigated this some years ago, and uh, going into the problem, we kind of you know, had asked paleontologists, well, you know, when did this happen? And they said, well, everybody knows since George Gaylord Simpson and before, you know, more, more than 100 years ago, actually in the 1880s, it was pointed out that, that horse teeth began to get very tall about 30 million years ago. You could really begin to see the change 30 million years ago. By 20 million years ago, they were tall, not as quite as tall as today. So modern horse tooth, before it actually erupts, is about that tall. Okay, very, that's why they have such deep lower jaws. Okay, so we sort of asked the paleontologist, well, you know, that's when they started eating grass. Well, what kind of grass? C4 grass, like the ones they eat now. 
So we thought we'd investigate this. And to our great surprise, what we found was that in different parts of the world, Pakistan represents sort of Southeast Asia, Texas representing the sort of the southern parts of North America, and Africa, all of Africa is between, basically between, is at low latitudes. What we found was that at a very narrow window of time, we saw changes from a pure C3 diet in, uh, in, in horses or in some other animals that if, if horses weren't present on that particular continent. <coughs> and by seven million years ago on all the continents, we had a pure C4 diet. So this represents C3 diet, C4 diet. So something happened uh, ecologically, and we still are exploring why this is. This is not a time period that necessarily makes a lot of sense as to why we should get this huge ecological uh, change. It's, for instance, not when the ice ages show up and so on. Um, so uh, basically what we've, what we've gone is, uh, if we look at today, the net primary productivity of terrestrial ecosystems is about 25%, and most of that's in the tropics. So in the tropical regions today, it represents 50% net primary productivity. And from what we can figure out, at 10 million years ago, which geologically is a short time ago, it was less than 1%. So we are sort of at the tail end right now of one of the major revolutions of plant ecology at the ecosystem scale. Okay, what has happened to sort of cause this complete takeover of ecosystems by C4 photosynthesis. Well, we've seen these diagrams. Jim showed a similar diagram to this yesterday. C4 plants have higher delta C13 values, so we might find it in animal tissues. Uh, and likewise, C3 plants have different values. We might find it in animal tissues. So we'd kind of like to explore that matter. So uh, here's one way of doing it. So this is a diagram where we had good representations of animal diets. And this is all wild animals. Uh, but we did isotope surveys of vegetation. We did isotope surveys of animals that were thought to be pure uh, uh, grazers uh, or pure browsers uh, in those ecosystems and we looked at the enamel. Now this is, gives a very tight uh, relationship of about 14.1 per mil. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that I need to point out on this is this is actually only for large ungulate mammals. Okay, so this is, this is not all mammals. And, and this uh, to us was a really major surprise because at that time when we did this study and this was published, I think, in 1989. There had only been two other, there had been two controlled diet experiments, and both were on very small rodents. And the answer that both of those studies had got was about 10 per mil. Okay? So prior to this study, people had been using 10 per mil, and suddenly you find out, oh, Actually, for the stuff that we collect as fossils, which we are interested in, it's 14 per mil. So a four per mil difference is significant. Well, looking at this further, um, okay, this, these are the lab experiments, sort of nine, 10 per mil, Larry Teason and Stan Ambrose. Uh, field studies, Lee Thorpe had suggested perhaps 12 per mil, and we ended up getting 14 per mil. So, well, why this difference? And uh, fortunately, uh, we were able to do a bunch of studies it, with our BYU colleagues to actually collect animal breath. So we could directly measure breath. Um, we could, in many cases, actually measure uh, uh, tooth enamel from the same animals uh, because they happened to uh, die at the end of our experiment. Um, and and, 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 and what we noticed is that the breath to enamel value is constant, okay? It didn't matter, seemed to what, mice, voles, rabbits, pigs, steers, 
kth out is constant. So that what that suggests is that the carbon dioxide in your blood uh, is in isotopic equilibrium between all of the relevant species. And so all the oxidized carbon, so the CO2 is in equilibrium with bicarbonate, is equal to the carbonate species, and this actually makes a lot of sense. Any place that by, by, by uh, carbonic anhydrase is present, the exchange takes ex ex place extremely rapidly. Okay, so this just means that things are in equilibrium. So that's actually really convenient because what it means is that to actually measure the isotope separation between diet and, bre and, and tooth enamel, you no longer need the enamel. You, all you need is a good representation of the diet. You need to know what the diet is, and you need to know what the breath is, and then you can apply the fractionation factor. So what was interesting was that actually there was a huge change between the breath and the diet. In these little tiny uh, mammals, the moles, or in this case the mice, the, 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 the mouse experiment that had been done by Larry Teason and Stan Ambrose was extremely different than the isotope separation between the breath and the diet for larger mammals. So all of the story is in here. What is the reason behind this? What we speculated was that this is just a difference in, uh, in production of methane. And as you'll see, especially uh, later on in uh, Kate Freeman's talk a week from today, that the isotope separation between carbon dioxide and methane is enormous. It's one of the largest isotope separations at 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, that equilibrium difference is about, 20, is about 60 per mil. So it's a huge, huge difference. And the carbon dioxide is very enriched. The methane is extremely depleted. So, so that, was, that was handy. And then what, what we could also then calibrate is just a bunch of other tissues. Uh, and what we find is that the isotope separation between C3 and C4 plants and any other tissue is the same uh, isotope um, separation independent of, of um, diet, of the isotope value of the diet. And here again, I might add a little caveat. Um, in my first lecture, I you know, sort of said that subtracting, doing the numerical subtraction of two isotope values is a great approximation and wonderful when you're talking between friends, but you don't want to put it in a paper. Um, after a few years of this kind of thing, somebody had actually published a paper saying, actually, the isotope separation is a, is a function of the isotope value of the diet. And somebody pointed out that, well, you know, you made a mistake that Harmon Craig warned you against in his paper in 1954, the first paper on carbon isotopes, and said, you must never do this. If, if the isotope separation is greater than 10 per mil, okay? So the other important point is that a lot of this stuff has been known for a long time, and please don't embarrass yourself and discover something in a comment on your article. And I just also might mention is, uh, if you're interested in carbon isotopes, um, reading Harmon Craig's paper of 1954 is a phenomenal paper because there's just so much information in there that you can still learn a lot from that 1954 paper. Okay, so um, steady state is a situation where a, a, a diet doesn't change and therefore um, we, can, we can get these equilibrium um, isotope uh, differences, okay? So it's just a very special mathematical case. And uh, as I mentioned, a lot of things in this class, when we're actually looking at a time dimension, we're looking at one aspect of a more complex equation. But this is the simplest case. Par C, par T is zero. So now, part two of my lecture, what happens if par C, par T is not equal to zero? Okay, the isotope ratio is changing with time. Okay, 